black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. And I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll, I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me, and this look of I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was he was he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage, all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? Gio. Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. Uh, Going to be speaking to uh, Hazel and her son, Brandon. And they've had some uh, very interesting things going on and around their property. And I know they even called uh, Jim Lansdale out from Killing Bigfoot, TV show on Destination America. And Jim will be coming on later to uh, talk about this property. Uh, But if you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance to check out sasquatchchronicles.com, you can become a member uh, for additional shows, you can also check out the store. Uh, some really cool stuff in there. Sweatshirts, shirts, beanies, uh, great Christmas gift, high-quality clothing in there. Uh, so if it interests you, check out SasquatchChronicles.com. Click on the shop button at the top. How's everyone doing tonight? I know it seems like a while since you've heard me. I've actually done a couple shows this week. Again, they're on uh, SasquatchChronicles.com if you want to uh, check them out. But thank you again for being here. Thank you for listening. Uh, Let's jump into it tonight. Hazel, welcome to the show. I appreciate you being here tonight. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Mike told me you would be calling. If you would, kind of start from the beginning. Uh, Did you, has it been ongoing activity there at the house, or is it uh, a one or two time type of occurrence? No. uh, When the people came here to do the show, they did a show here. Uh, for seven days. They was here for seven days. And uh, they found a lot of activity out here in the yard, in my garden, and back here in the pond. And and then uh, me and my son, Brandon, had uh, we had went in the woods, and we found some tracks, and we called the game Waters to Come. We called the uh, our local index to come, Sabine Index to come, and look at the track. So we cast it, and then we got a hope to... Um, Mr. Jim, and then uh, Mr. Woolley, he got involved. So they, they've been around here for a while. Oh, I got you. Killing The Killing Bigfoot show with Jim Lansdale? Yes. Now, Brandon, you're Hazel's son. Tell me about some of the things that were going on around the property. What, what kind of things did you notice? I found the first track, and how I found it was just by accident. Uh, somebody was harassing my grandmother down there. Shine a light in our house. We figured it was some little kids, you know. They even called the sheriff department, trying to catch them. And they, they was even, you know, patrolling, trying to catch, figure out who it was. But anyway, they'd done it one night. And I told my dad, I said, maybe they're coming in from the wildlife management area side on four wallows. So I'm going to get up in the morning and walk down the road. Just we got a road through our property. And, uh, Walking down that red clay road to see if I can see any tracks, human tracks. Well, down there, when we, the game warders put up a, a gate at the edge of our property, and they told us we can, because there was an access road going into the wildlife management area. So we're going to shut this road down, which are on both sides of the road. When we got to the, got to the, to the uh, fence row, 
it's a little it's a little tr- cow trail going down there to the pond, but the cows ain't wasn't on that side for pretty many months. I walked down that down that cow trail ways because we had poachers before cut our fence and come in from that side because, like I said, the road comes all the way up to right there. So I was gonna see it. So maybe they breaking the fence and coming in from that way. Well, I just got right off the road, not even maybe 20 yards, and I seen the track. It was during the summertime. It was real hot. It was dry. It was in a, one little sandy place there, and it was uh, the pressure was deep into the to the sand. Well, uh, Mr. Jim knows. You know, I'm uh, always been outdoors, and I know what's going on in the woods and stuff. When I seen it, I ain't gonna lie, it freaked me out because I knew it, I knew what it was, but I ain't never seen one. So I I eased on out. Uh, of the road, I came back to my truck, and I really didn't know what to do, so I called my uncle, Mama's brother. He was the Choctaw Apache chief at the time. He said, "You need to call the. You can get up. You need to call the index, and he called the sheriff department to come cast the track. Or well, I called the sheriff department." And the sheriff department said, we don't do that. We're going to send out wildlife and fishery. I got to the house. The index man said he was calling to be on his way. But he said that we need to go back out there and cover up the track so no animal walked through the track. And so we went back out there. Mom and I got a butcher shop, so Daddy brought a big gut bucket to cover up the track. And the time we got back, the index man was here. And... Uh, I brought him in there. Mama, she just had a surgery, and she wanted to go in there with us. And uh, you could drive right up there close to, like I said, it's a road. And he took pictures and everything. He a, was a big man, jumping up and down, you know, trying to imitate the track. I told him, I said, you can break your foot and keep doing that. You know, he, he said, I can see it was real, real heavy. I said, I know. I, I said, that's what freaked me out. I said, I knew, I knew it was a big foot track. I said, I knew it was real, real heavy. I said, you know, on the processing plant, you know, we all know, I see all kind of different animals and nose weights and stuff, cows and stuff. I said, I knew it was real, really big. That's what really freaked me out. So he took a bunch of pictures and he covered the track up for me. It was a center block. He put the center block back on top of the gut bucket. And time we came out back to the gate of the cow pasture, the wildlife fish was there. There's two of them. I told them, I said, uh, I got to bring him back to the up the road or back to the house to his car and I'll be back. They was kinda cocky. Which I told Mr. Jim there. But they they followed me on in there and done the same thing. They was taking all kind of pictures of the track. They were just like me. They was kinda freaked out. I mean I'm taking a lot of pictures of it. And then the other one he started looking on the fence row. It didn't dawn on me then what he was doing at the time. But then I said, oh, you looking for hair? He said, he didn't really say anything. But he said, yeah. He said, I agree. That's, that's a weird track. And he wanted to know. He said, what's down this trail? I said, it's a pond down there at the end of that trail. He said, oh, it is. I said, yeah, it's real, real thick down there around that pond. And he said, well, I see it's thick going down there to the pond. I said, right. They took pictures, and then we left. That one game owner said, well, you can probably go to walmart and get the stuff called plaster pairs then i sent jim them an email and then it went long he contacted me and i sent him it was another group too another lady she had came later on after mr jim and then uh i started looking paying more attention started really kind of looking for the tracks and down there in a pond i found all kind of tracks that were made cast of i put a Put a lot of this stuff in the paper, you know. I put it out there in public, let the public decide. I mean, I mean, you see the tracks that we put in the paper, you know, you can see that it, that it's a weird track. It's a freaky looking track. Found a lot of trees. I call them a Freddy Cougar tree. They're like, you know, something with big old claws just ripped it up and uh, broke a bunch, broke, bent over and broke a bunch of trees around there. Found dead hogs. I found dead hogs in the woods, tore up, and uh, sent pictures of Mr. Jim, the pictures. 
and stuff like that. that but but then but then but then other times I'd be walking around looking for a track. One time, uh, mom and them had a box stand. I got hurt on the job and I, I wasn't really able to do nothing. So I just went one day, just kind of hobbled down there to check on it. They'd been blowed or blowed over. The guy lines was holding it, keep from falling, hitting the ground. Two legs was on the ground, two legs was up in there. I was just standing by that thing and it's thick around there by, by the pond, away from the pond, about 300 yards. And then all of a sudden, woof, something landed by me. Well, I knew it wasn't a limb because there wasn't no trees right there around me. Something was thrown at me. And then I started, I started hearing that whistle stuff. I could hear it walking back and forth through the thicket, but it kind of had me blocked off the way I walked in. It's the one little trail walking in. I said, well, I ain't gonna lie. I said, what the hell am I going to do now? I said, you know, it kind of got me hemmed up in there. So I kind of got freaked out. Then I finally just kind of started saying some bad words. Said, hey, you know, get on. You know, I thought I might have been a hunter or something like that, but. Finally, it just walked off. But when it walked off, it walked off, you know, with that little low, like, whistling. That happened uh, three or four different times. Then I hear the wood knocks. Then I can hear the the whoops different times. But in the, in the evening times, uh, across the road here from our house, this where I was talking about around the pond is a different place. It's probably about a quarter mile from the house. Now, across the road here from the house, it's, the same thicket, thicket like a uh, woodland, and they would hear the the whistles, and then the hoops, the whoops. They would be talking like back and forth towards each other. And uh, uh, one time, Daddy was well. What had happened? They had cut the timber, and Daddy was piling up a bunch of brush tops out here in the yard. We live on seventeen and a half acres of land, but. Uh, the family property here is about 250 total down the road. And uh, he was burning on the brush tops, and that's when he started hearing all that whistling and whooping that one evening. And uh, Mr. Jim and Mr. Mike said they was probably, you know, ticked off because of all the smoke, you know. But as far as them actually coming up in the yard, that was what Mama had seen at that time when she had told you was really actually the stuff. First time that we actually seen it come up, you know, actually seen it in the yard. <coughs> now, when Mr. Jim then came, I brought him one time before, before they even done the show. It's a little trail up in the woods there, and then they had a place baited for the uh, wild hogs, a bunch of wild hogs on our property. And the wild hogs had a big wallet right there. For well, my uncle, Nam, I showed Mr. Jim that after they'd done the show, this was about maybe a couple months after the show, I was going down there checking on the place because I was going to set my was going to set my little girl up there and shoot a little hog. But I, when I walked down there, my uncle and I was on the other side of the hill down there. There was bush hogging and using a power saw. There was knocking and banging. It's a big hill there. And then down the hill where they was at, but it's all thicket. Well, I was easing down the little hog trail and then I got about middle ways of the ridge, top of the ridge, and I looked down at the end of the trail down there. It's a little straightaway, old road, what it is, it growed up, pine thicket around it. And then I seen it down there. I seen that black spot, and it was looking at me. But like I always see it from, like, waist up. But as soon as it, it, seen, it knew I seen it, it hit the dang briar. I think it, it sounded like a 10-point buck tearing through the dang briars. And, you know, I seen it like sideways, and that's what really freaked me out. And then, and then Mama seen it that time uh, here in the yard. Then she seen it another. Uh, I don't know if it's the same one, but she had seen another one. Something. Yes, it was. It was. A, it was. It was a weird looking too. But that one time I seen it, my brother had seen it years before, and then. Uh, the one she had seen here in the yard uh, wasn't long ago. Let me ask you, Brandon, and then I'll, I'll we'll jump to Hazel. I wanted to ask you, before we talk about the sighting, the track that you found, can you describe the track? What was the size of it? What did, what did it look like to you? What was it that really bothered you about the track? Well, you know, I knew it, it, it kind of looked like a bear track, but 
I knew it wasn't a bear track because it was too long and too wide. And like I said, it was in the like in the sand, and you could see the outline of the impression real good. What would bother me would bother me about the track because this this was it was, I believe it was around end of June or August, and it was hot. The ground was real real hard. Yeah, uh, uh, a muscled up man probably would have a hard time digging a post hole using a post hole to try to dig a, dig a post hole because uh, the ground was so hard and and it was down and the the impression was down in the ground at least three to four inches oh wow that's a heavy that's what, heavy, that's, heavy, what, heavy. that's what right that's what that's what freaked me out because i knew it was real real heavy you know i knew no no man no company you know walking and, and something like that but you, we ain't worry about that problem because there ain't nobody over there on, on our place anyway. It's interesting the game warden's reaction to it, almost like they were kind of looking around for other evidence. Yeah, they they like I said they was freaked out. They was, they was taking a lot a lot of pictures with their cell phones, and I just said, "Well, what y'all think?" He said, "Well, we don't." That's what they said. We don't know what it is. I mean, they admit it to it. We don't know what it is. All we know is it's weird looking. It ain't no they say it. It ain't no bear track. I said, well, I, done, I knew that. I said, I knew it wasn't a bear track. He said, well, the, uh, then they said, you need to put up a game camera or whatever to know for sure what it is. They wouldn't come out and say, you know, yeah, that's that's a Bigfoot track, but they acknowledged it wasn't a human track, and they acknowledged it wasn't a bear track, so, you know. Yeah, I'd love to see the track. I'd love to see the track that you captured. Uh, now, when you saw from these tracks to where your home is, what kind of a distance are we talking about? About a quarter mile, maybe a little further. So pretty, pretty close, actually, pretty close to the home. When you saw the creature uh, that time, can you describe what you saw? Was it more or less just kind of a black blob looking at you, or could you see any details? No, I could, I could see his head, his face, it was sideways to me. It was it was hiding them behind a bunch of little young sapling pine trees, and it was a lot of salt fires around there, real good, and it was hit pretty good. But I guess once it knew I pegged him, you know, just being taught, you know, in the woods, you know, look for a deer, you know, like deer or hog, you know, look for an ear, look for a nose, look for anything, you know, you know, while you hunt, and which it was the same thing what I was doing, but it knew I that I done pegged it. But I could see his head, you know, was funny looking up at the top, like cone, you know, like around it, you know. And I could see he had real big broad shoulders sideways. And I could see half of its uh, left side of its arm. It was all muscular looking. But it was, I guess, about from the the torso up is what I could see. And then when I kind of, you know, kind of went to moving like left to right to, to try to look at it better, and that's when I knew I pegged it. It was like, you know, maybe like a second or two, and that's when it hit the dang briar thick. Sounded like a dang bull elk turning through there. Yeah, they do when they go through the brush like that. They they sound like King Kong going through there. I wanted to ask you, what? how big do you think the creature was? That one was probably around seven, maybe maybe eight foot tall. Yeah, that's interesting. And it was all black. Could you see any details of the face? I mean, was there anything that you picked up on? Did it... I couldn't pick. I could. I couldn't make no details of the face. But like I said, it was standing behind him, little saplings. You know, all the little green saplings had it that kind of broken up. But you know, it just. I could see see it back there. You know, you couldn't help see it. You know, at black and behind the behind the green. You know. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, Brandon. You sound like an outdoors guy, and uh, I know you guys are. You, I mean, it sounds like you've you've been a woodsman your whole life. Have you always known about these things? Or what was going through your mind when you saw it? And you saw the track. I mean, did it a reality hit you while wow, these things are real, or did you already know about them? What, what were you thinking at the time? Well, down down the road from uh, to the left of our house, there was a lady. She seen it there. Uh, her husband, her and her husband, both was just as of the face. They live. I went to school with their daughters. They live about, I want to say, maybe three to four miles from our house up the dirt road. 
And then when they seen it, they done the same thing. They called the, uh, well, I believe it was Sawali, the little town of Sawali Police Department to come out. I think somebody did come out, but then, you know, it done, it was done gone uh, when they seen it on the side of the road. And then another time, their road that they live on at the end of the road runs into the wildlife management area, too. And a game warden was coming through there, Mr. Gentry, and it's a big high line before you get to their house. Then it's a uh, pipeline on the other side of it. Well, he seen it run across the road, and he come to Mr. Ebar's house and said, "Do you got a big gun?" He said, "Yes, sir. I got a big a big gun." He said, "I don't have a big enough gun in my truck." I seen he didn't say a monster. He said, "I seen a big animal." I don't want to go back and look, but that's what it was. But that's what he had called it. And when they went back, but naturally, you know, it was gone. Then they had a German Shepherd dog, a uh, yard dog, and they live in the woods, a little bit more secluded than we do. We live way out in the woods, but we got neighbors, but they got big pastures in between the the landowners, uh, the people who live at a distance, but. The dog come missing, stayed barking all the time, and it finally came up missing. Then it finally will come up there in their yard, about the same thing, but knocking on their trailer and stuff, and they end up moving to Shreveport, Louisiana, because uh, it would stay harassing them all the time. They was on the uh, Finding Bigfoot show, but that was year, you know, that happened years ago, and then, uh, like I say, you know, our, our Native people will talk about it, but you know, I, I, I never, never would, uh, never seen a track, you know, no, and that was the first track ever was seen, the one that I found. They just seen it. They never did final tracks, you know. And then, like, I don't know how many years later, and then, like I told Mr. Jim, then whoops, I really never did pay it no mind. I probably was hearing it for years, but out here, so many cow, cattlemen, I said, hell, I thought it was the cattlemen calling the cows. Oh, but I once I started paying attention, you know, knew, knowing that so-and-so ain't out there feeding his cows, you know, that the cows was fed yesterday, then the next day I would hear the whooping. I said, then, like I said, now, you, he said, now you're paying attention. Here, Mr. Woolley said, you know, now you're paying attention. That, you've probably been hearing it your whole life. You just ain't paying no attention to it because, you know, the, the all the cattlemen out here. I said, well, yeah, I always thought somebody was calling cows, but but it wasn't nobody calling cows. Yeah, that's really interesting. What is your thoughts on these things, Brandon? And I'll I'll we'll jump to Hazel here in a moment and talk about what she saw. But what is your take on these things? What's your feeling on them? Does it worry you at all that they're that close to the house, or does it not bother you that much? Yeah, it it bothers me. Like I said, that one time, what happened at the box stand. You know, I don't know if they just was throwing it to, like, to scare me off or it was trying to hit me, whatever it threw. Uh, I know some all bunch of all all fill pipe around there that was cut up through the woods where they drilled all was a long time ago. I never did go look at what it was, but that's what it sounded like to me. Something that heavy or a big rock. It was a big old whoop. An- another time uh, down probably 150 yards down there. It's another stand that's on the ground. And they done the same thing, but it was two of them at time when they was whistling. And Mama and them was sitting on the porch. And I had a shotgun. I never did know they was out on the porch that I got back, and they heard me shoot because they were asking, where did you shoot at? I said, well, I was down there just looking at the stand. I said, and that thing, I so I called it that thing. That, I said it was two things. I said, one was on the other side of the fence, on the game reserve side, one was on our side going, pacing back and forth through the woods, that whistling crap. I said, so I just shot it because it, would, it wouldn't go away. It, it, like, it had me hemmed up. That's the only way I could go back. Like I said, you know, this day we'll have to walk either with a cane or with a walking stick. Ain't like I couldn't run from it, you know. And then it went along. It, 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 I never did hear it no more. It it was it was gone. But like I told Mr. Jim now, it was probably like six years I wasn't able to hunt. 
And all that time, see, all that air around there was calm. Nobody was going in, putting out dairy corn. Nobody was going out there jerking on stands, getting up dairy stands, knocking, banging on stands. He said, you know, what it was, they was mad at me because I was going in their bed and area when the whole, all the mother years where they had it to their Oh, I gotcha. That actually makes a little bit of sense. Yeah, that they would they would show up in that area because no one's really bothering them. What I find interesting is that the game warden told you to put up game cams. Uh, from all the witnesses I've ever spoke to, a lot of hunters, a lot of people have these things around their property. The moment they start putting up game cams, all activity stops. And so it makes you wonder, that's an interesting thing for him to tell you to put up game cams. Because from what, I, what I've researched and looked into this and investigated and everything else, they avoid those like the plague. So I thought it was interesting he told you to do that. Have you seen fishing game out there anymore around your property? Yeah, yeah, they are, they are here all the time, you know, because like I said, the game the game reserve butts up to all our property. On the other side, matter of fact, the game, the game reserve got 120 acres leased from us. That's not counting the two-something. But, uh, but anyway, uh, on the other side, that we would hear a lot of sounds and stuff, but we wouldn't really go on that side. Mostly the stuff was happening on on our place because, like I said, it's so thick. Jim never see it. I mean, it's, it's when I say thick, it's thick. It, we got tall, big pine trees, but between the pine trees, the the pine saplings grew back natural, a natural growth, and it's it's real, real thick. And Hazel, how long ago did it come up to your yard? It's been about two weeks two weeks and what time of day was it when he saw the creature it was dark uh walk us into what you were doing and and if you would just walk us into what you saw what you experienced okay um we got three street lights down here <laughs> and uh brandon he wanted something out of his truck binoculars so i said i would go out there and get it but i got this little flashlight so i clicked it i got at the door and i clicked it on on to shine and, but I wanted it to shine more, so you have to click it some more. So I got to the top step, and I was fooling with the flashlight, and then I shined that away toward Brandon's truck the way I had to go to the truck where he got it up under the shed. But as I was fooling with the flashlight, I was on the top step, fixing to get on the second step, and that's when I seen it. It was standing there by my husband's truck. And what did I say? I said, see it. You see it. See, I got COPD, and it got me so excited. I said, oh, hell no. And what I did, I thought it was going to jump on me. So I started reaching for the screen door, which is glass that has a handle on it. So I started fumbling around with that handle, trying to get in the house without turning around. <laughs> and I, I guess it hear me moving that handle around. So then it shot off behind this building with that we got, we call it the smokehouse because that's where we smoke meat at. And then it ran off and I didn't see it anymore. But it wasn't black. It was brown. Yeah. How, how big do you think it was? This is what I told Jim. I told Jim it was about eight foot tall when I called him and it was about a thousand pounds. Yeah, that's a big boy. And it was just standing by your husband's truck? Yeah, you're just standing there. Well, the reason I thought and I told Jim that it came up here is because I had just got some biddies, baby chicks, that is, what we call them, biddies. But I had 400 of them in a building here. And I also had what they call heating lamps. That's to keep them warm. So that building was kind of glowing red. And then all that sound was coming out of there. And like Jim said, he thought, that it was curious. That's the reason it came here to the house. Yeah, that's the, yeah, you could be right. You absolutely could be right. Can For the audience, can you describe what you saw? Was it just a tall, brown creature? Were you able to see any details? It was huge. Uh, we, got a bar, we got a small bar here in the house. Uh, and when I talked to Jim, I told him it was as wide as that bar. It was huge across the chest. And its arm, its whole body was huge. What did you think when he saw it, Hazel? Were you obviously you were scared trying to get back into the home? But... Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was. I was scared. I first, first I was going to try to holler, but I couldn't get it out. 
So that's the only thing I knew what to do was start reaching for that door behind me and get back in the house. But I didn't want to turn around because I thought that thing was going to jump on me. Yeah, I don't blame you. I think I would have been terrified, too, seeing it right there in your yard. Uh, does it worry you that, that it came up that close to the home? Uh, yeah. You know, I don't be going around out there at night with no little flashlight. You know, even though I got um, three security lights out there, now I have a different kind of light. But I, I don't know what to tell you about that. No, I'm not scared, you know, just frightened to death. But I was scared when I seen it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. Most people, they, you know, they want to see these things. And then when you see them, it, it terrifies you. Um, it does? Yeah, no, that, yeah, it does. It, it definitely, you know, and, and you know that from firsthand. Did the creature vocalize at all? Did it make any sort of noise or anything? No, but it I... Early, it did earlier with the lady, those people was here. And see, uh, it, it's a man. He lives up the road. He lives uh, up the road, and he's an ex-cop, or he's is a cop. And he was out there shooting his pistol, which he does it all the time. And it's hunting season here now. He had an AR. And uh, so I don't know if that made it mad or or what, but he, he does it, though, all the time. All the time. Uh, he's like, like, smells in front of us, but it's through the woods. And he was out there shooting a lot. We had company that, that evening, and they said, well, what is that sound? Well, then we started hearing it. But I wasn't going to tell the lady that I had just met, well, that's Bigfoot whistling, making that sound, because she thought I was crazy, which I'm not. But I knew what it was when when I heard it, but I wouldn't tell her. What, what kind of noise? Because she asked me. She asked me, "What is that sound?" So, oh, I don't know. But I wouldn't tell her. I already knew what it was, but I wouldn't tell her. Yeah, no, and I can understand that. What what kind of noise was it making? It just makes hoops, like hoops and whistle sounds. But I done heard that before, many many years ago. Oh, so you've you've heard it out there before. <laughs> Oh, yeah. One time I was cleaning a deer. Let me, let me tell him. Then you, get, you can tell him your part. Okay. I shot I shot a deer down the road just years ago, 20 years ago or more. Between me and my grandma's house is about not even a quarter mile, maybe that. But I shot a deer, and uh, it was late in the evening. I didn't have no flashlight, so I came home, got my brother, Russell. He was young then. Me and him was tracking it. I had the flashlight and he was following behind me and I was letting him stay at the last blood. Then it was tall timber across the road, all tall timber. I was, I was finding good blood, pieces of lung and the blood, you know, kind of pink looking, foam looking. I said, well, the deer ain't far. We got in the woods about 200 yards. Then I started hearing that dang sound. This is the first time that Probably we knew, you know, something was, was weird, you know. We call it a booger, is what we call it. My brother was getting scared. He was asking, what's that sound? I act like I didn't hear him. I said, it ain't nothing. This this was fine a deer, but it really, I was, it was freaking me out. I could hear it. It was what it was doing. It was it was uh, a whooping sound and a howling sound, but it was at a distance. Well, uh, we were fine where the deer would stop. It would be a bunch of blood. And then it would take off again. And then I said, well, the deer can't be too far. And then we found one big bunch of blood to last, and that was it. It, it wasn't hardly no blood. I mean, you know, I was, that's what got me puzzled. But then it, the sound was real close. Well, I turned around a little back. He got scared. He was gone. He walked back out to the road. Well, he he just said he, he's right here in the kitchen. He ran back out to, to my truck. He's by my truck. You know, anyway, uh, so I come on, come on back out with that little rinky dink flashlight we had. Well, I didn't, we didn't know when we come back up the driveway, mama, she was on the outside skinning the deer, somebody to drop off to be processed, but they had the deer, they had the hair and everything on it. You know, they didn't want to skin it. We do that, you know, but they, she was skinning the deer and I told my brother, we didn't figure she she heard the sound because it was kind of it was kind of windy, but it wasn't windy enough where you, you couldn't hear it. You could hear it really good. And then uh, she she first thing she said she said, "What's that sound?" I said, "You hear that?" 
I call it a booger. I say, you heard that booger sound? She said, yeah. Well, see, the only thing we figured out was Jim and Mike said, between the blood off the deer I got and then the blood off the one she was cleaning, that's what attracted it. But like I said, they that they uh, more likely that one, well, it was just one, it uh, got my deer. Because, like I said, it was a bunch of big puddle of blood, and that was it. It was no more blood trail. They must have got it. But what was mad was they said that we was still consistent trying to find my deer, and they didn't want us around there. Well, I say they, I mean, he didn't want us around there. And then, too, you know, it smelt the blood of another one, so it thought, you know, maybe I had shot two, and they wanted that one, too. But the other one was up way up the, up the road here. Mm, not even a quarter of a mile, maybe about 500 yards, where she was claiming the other deer, see? I got so you. So that's what they said. That's what they figured, you know, that more likely is that it, that it got my deer. And and it, did, it didn't want me, me and my brother, pursuing the blood trail to try to get the deer, you know? That's when it, was, it kept getting closer and closer and closer. You know, you guys call them boogers yeah. down in the south, and I know down south, uh, especially folks that live out in the country, uh, they 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 hear them and see them a lot, and rarely do they ever talk about them. That's why I really appreciate you guys coming on the show and talking about it because. But some... that but that was that was the the first time. Like I said, that was like twenty something years ago, and then we ain't hear nothing. We ain't seen nothing. No tracks. Nothing like that. You know, I heard the little sounds where I thought it was somebody every once in a blue moon, what I call it, that I thought it was somebody calling cows, but I didn't hear no whistling or nothing like that. And then till I got hurt, I got hurt like 09, and then like five, six year time span, wasn't nobody going in there, like, you know, going in there, like I said, there's no deer stands or anything. Yeah, leaving sin everywhere. So like they said, they had a, they had the whole little land down there to the sales. And when we started going down there looking around, they did they didn't like that. It was irritating. Them. Yeah, have you guys ever had any um, animals come up missing on the property? Any livestock come up missing? I, I realize you know when you live in the country, you have predators that come in and take. Uh, no, sometimes. no, no. Well, we got a lot of animals, hogs and chickens and. Uh, rabbits and, and stuff like that, but uh, no, we ain't never uh, had nothing come up and just kill it. No. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, it, these these creatures are fascinating because sometimes on people's property, uh, they can become violent and aggressive really quick. It kind of sounds like that was what was going on with the neighbors that ended up moving that you were talking about, Brandon, uh, where they'll come up and just kind of terrorize you. And it doesn't really seem to be that in this case. It seems like they kind of leave you guys alone. I mean, they're around the property and they're probably killing deer and killing all the wild hogs, but they're not really terrorizing you guys. They're not really coming up to the home and banging on the house or throwing rocks at the house or, you know, just completely terrorizing you guys. No. No, just just in the woods when we in the around like where it's like a good where it's a good place for like deer or hogs or something like that. That's when the only time that they get like aggressive, like I say, you know, they'll throw something or they'll knock up, make a wood knock up on a tree or start that whistling close to you and stuff like that. Like Mr. Jim and them said, you know, they know when you got a gun, you know, and and then like I say, you know, I shot that one time and they it went on, but but they was, I they freaking out. They was pretty, they was pretty damn close to me, going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then uh, maybe about 20 yards inside the thicket. Well, I couldn't see nothing in that, that bad thicket. It's really, really thick. So I just shot into the thicket. And then and then I didn't hear it no more. It, it was like, you know, they, like they weren't even there. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, be careful popping off shots like that. I mean, not necessarily, you know, because if you hit one of these things, uh, just, again, from talking to witnesses that have shot them, uh, it tends to go bad pretty quickly after you shoot one. If it's not the one you shot, then another one pops out. And well, you, you know, Hazel, Mike's your cousin. Mike Willie's your cousin. Uh, how aggressive they can be, and I'm sure you, you know the story. You know as well, Brandon. 
uh, how they can come yeah. out and uh, you never know how right. they're going to react or how they're right. going to, you know, like Mike Woolley's encounter. I, I thought Mike was in danger that day. I really did. I, I don't think they were toying with him. I think the only thing that saved his life was having that gun and firing off that shot. But the strange part is, yeah, it, you, you, you know where he's seen them. It's not too but, far from here. But see, we didn't, we didn't know that, you know, that all these people done came here and, and done the show and everything, and then then Mike, Mr. Mike started coming, and then Mr. Mike told me, told us where that happened. See, like, Mr. R- Miss Rosie Bora happened to her to the left of us, and then what happened to Mr. Mike to the right of us is probably about the same distance, five or six miles. So we were, we were in the middle between the two. Both, both, you know, both instances. What, what, it, what had happened? That's interesting. We live right in, the, right in the middle of the wildlife management area. So him and Mr. Jim come that time, and that's when he had told us. But like I said, they didn't came out here and talked to us and game warners and all them people that came. Then later on, you know, it was a long time after, and that's when Mike said, "Well, you know, Brandon up the road there, but you know, so and so place." I said, "Yeah." He said, "That's where I got ran out of woods." You know, it kind of freaked me out, you know, because, like I said, you, you know, it it ain't it ain't far through from us. Uh, it would be like if you live in town, you know, but five or six miles from us, it, it's it's still wood. You're still in a reserve either either way. Oh yeah, no, five or six miles is close. That's really close. I had no idea that Mike's encounter was that close to you guys. Uh, that's that's very close, five or six miles. Uh, and that's interesting. That's really, really interesting. So this activity has been, this isn't anything recent or anything new. Obviously, finding the tracks or you seeing it, Hazel, is new, but it kind of sounds like they've been there for a long time. Been where? Living here? No, the the Sasquatches have been around that property for a long time. Oh, yeah, probably about 20-something 20, 20 years. Yeah, because I think Mike's encounter happened, what, back in the 80s, didn't it? Early 80s? If I yeah, right. something like that. Yeah. Well, be careful out there, guys. I, you guys and gals, please be careful. Brandon, do you ever go back out and, and look around for tracks or anything? Or Yeah, I, w- I went out today, you know, looking around. Um, when Mama, uh, I called and told Mr. Jim, and then Mr. I'm sorry, I, I told him, and then Mr. Jim came, uh, went along after. Man, come from Shreveport with a video camera. And let's see him, Mr. Jim, another yeah. man. Eh? Two more men came with Mr. Jim that we ain't, uh, we ain't never met. And um, well, Mr. Jim and another man came the other day, but I wasn't here. I was went to check my little daughter's stand, deer on stand, and uh, they weren't here to talk to me, so they left. Then when they come back, this what happened to Mama. Then they came back this other time. Uh, they had a guy there with a camera, and I brought him down there. Uh, and showed them, you know, like where the tracks were. And he like videoed the pond, and and then you could see like the thickets, you know. I mean, it's if it wouldn't be for that road that's in there between there, you couldn't get in there unless you make a trail with a pile of saw, uh, bulldozer. I mean, it's it's that thick. But that road going in there, see, like he, I found tracks going up down that road, and little juvenile tracks too, uh, little little bitty tracks. <clears throat> on that road I found before where there where the uh, wall deer hunting stands were we made a round through there and on the the head of the pond it's a branch that comes out of the wildlife management area feeds the pond uh, I found tracks there before that I put in the paper there was a big track there that I found there two different times I guess they how they feel like they're still in, on the back between our thicket and then the, the real bad thicket over there in the corner of the fence on the wildlife management side. They walking down that fence road because it's clean walking. Uh, probably like a bush hog, one bush hog laying wide, but it ain't been bush hog, but it's it just that clean, you know, through there. It's a little sapling here and there, but uh, they're walking down there and they're crossing right there in that little muddy place there when they cross that little the little branch, what it is, when they cross that little branch there, 
uh, I get a track every once in a while, you know. When we came back to the house, uh, they want to look in the yard to see if we can find some tracks because they're getting ready to leave. I said, yeah, we can do that. So we looked out in the yard, out in the front of the yard. It's like a pretty big field. They find some uh, here and there. It wasn't really good ones. We, then we walked down the road in front of the house is a, is a road, a parish road. And then we got all the way around almost to the driveway. And then mom and them got a garden. And they found like some up in the garden, but it wasn't very good. And then I got up there where they was at because I was looking on the side of the road. And then I could see, uh, and they filmed that where it came out of the road, across the road, and it came up the ditch because there's a pretty big ditch there up to there where they was at. And you can see the deep impressions where it, where it climbed the bank. But Mr. Jim said that it looked like a it was a it was a Bigfoot track, but it don't look like the same one, you know, that came from the same one. It looked like a smaller one. That's what he said. You know, they they've been they've been around here a lot. We just ain't we just ain't been seeing them in the yard. To to she finally seen that one. Did you ever go and talk to the cop that's popping off shots with his AR-15 and ask him? Hey, are you target practicing, or are you actually shooting at something? Because I yeah, that's, wonder if he's seen them and he's that, popping off shots at them. That's that's uh, that's what he does. He's target practice. He got a thing. I was in the woods that day, uh, just looking around, checking corn on stands and stuff like that, and I could hear all that dang shit. And I said, God, I leave this one. But that day, most time he shoots a pistol. But that day, he he had to have like an AR or something like that with a big magazine because, I mean, it was just like nonstop, pow, 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 pow. And he done like that all for like 30 or 40 minutes. You know, he he had time to drop another clip, and he must have had time to put another clip. I mean, it was just nonstop shooting. I said, dang, he's shooting up the world over there. But that's what it is. He just just retired, you know, he just likes to shoot. He just be shooting like that all the time when he's here. He lives in Baton Rouge. When he ain't Baton Rouge there, he just be shooting a lot. Do you ever go up and talk to him and say, hey, listen, there's some things out here, right? Have you ever asked him, have you ever seen anything strange out here? Try to have a conversation with them about what you guys have seen and what you guys have experienced? No, he's kind of seclusive, you know. Right. If you see him in the yard, he'll go inside his house. They don't look to be like social with people, you know, like and then like I said, he's kinda of like shooting too. I don't really want to go and talk to somebody, you know, because you you know, you never know, you know, out in the woods, you don't know how people are, especially somebody just stay shooting all the time like they crazy, you know. Yeah, thirty minutes straight with an AR, that's that's a lot of ammo to burn through. Uh so you're probably right, he's probably just off shooting just to shoot, you know. You guys will have to keep me up to date. Let me know what happens out there on that property. You know, it's scary enough to run into these things when you're out hiking or when you're out hunting. But when it's, a, you know, that close to your home, uh, for me, I, anyway, it, it would worry me a little bit that it's they're that close. You know, especially after hearing Mike's encounter, you're talking, you know, five or six miles from your guys' place. That's really close. But when you're out there, I guess, you know, what are you going to do? There's not much you can it's not like you can just pick up and go, you know what I mean? Move to the city or that would just worry me, especially after Mike's encounter and it coming up that close. That's pretty, pretty ballsy for that thing to come up and be standing out by yeah, the truck. Yeah. yeah. That's what I was saying. You know, that's why that one time, you know, I, I just, I just shot to the ticket, which I knew it wasn't nobody around there because, you know, it's, it's on our land, you know, and I knew what nobody, my brother going up down there, I, you know, I, I knew what it was because I done, you know, I done seen the tracks and everything. It was in the paper and stuff, but it was two of them. And like I said, you know, it, it's like that. I don't know if they were stalking me or like Jim said, you know, it might have been two juveniles or it might have been uh, two females was mad because I um, was around the, the little ones or whatever because we don't find the little tracks and Jim don't found some little tracks. And they were just trying to like intimidate me. That's really what they what they've been doing, you know, a couple of times. Like when I threw one time in threw a rock, and this other time here where they was real, real close. It's like they were trying to intimidate me, you know. Uh, 
when they were just said just like walking back and forth, pacing back and forth. And the other side, other side of the fence row is a little branch, but the little branch ain't very wide. It might be maybe 10 yards wide, and it's another thicket, and another one on the other side was doing the same thing. You know, I didn't have nowhere to go. And then when I shot, you know, everything just got quiet. I didn't even hear him walk off. Like he said, Jim said, they didn't even run off, Brandon. He said, I just common sense. They knew you had a gun, so what they more likely what they done. See, I thought they walked off. We was talking about the other day. He said, no, they just got real, real still and let you leave out from there where you was at. They knew not to come to you because, you know, they, like he said, they, they know what a gun is, you know, because they hear it all the time popping in the woods. He said, yeah, that's what they done. They got real, real still. I got the heck out of there. Yeah, and that's interesting, Brennan. You know, you being a woodsman and, and you knowing this and, and Hazel and everyone else knows this, you fire off a shot, a normal wild animal is going to run. I mean, it wants nothing to do with that gun. It's going to take off. And the behavior of these things is so odd for it just to be quiet and let you leave and and just be silent at that point. You know, that's not normal animal behavior. What What do you think a booger is, Brennan, in your opinion? And there's no wrong answer. I'm just curious on what you think these things are. If, if it's a booger, like I say, you know, if you would, if it wants to do you something, it's going to do you something, you know. Uh, if 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 you didn't have nothing to defend yourself, uh, like you said, you'd be up the creek without a paddle. You couldn't fight at all. I know I couldn't, especially now being hurt. But you, uh, an, a grown man uh, that was able-bodied couldn't fight at all. But so let's say more than one, you you wouldn't have a chance. But yeah, and then like I said too, you know, if uh, if you was around the, it's the little ones, or if you was there where you were supposed to be, or come up around a kill that had been killed, you just would be in a bind. You know, it would it, it would it probably would kill you. If it would kill you, uh, you'd be all busted up. You know, be almost left for dead. But then, too, you know, like Jim said, you know, they like to play pranks on people. They like to, like, that's what I was saying, like, they was intimidate me that day, you know. Like I said, you know, they they might have been too just like, and it might have been two young ones, you know. It, it was like picking at you, you know, because they knew you weren't supposed to be there, but they didn't want you there. What do you think they are? Do you think it's just a non-human primate? Or what? what is your opinion? Do you think it's a monkey running around? No, I think it's I think it is it's just like the our ancestors you should say, you know, it's 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 a Bigfoot. Just a creature out there in the woods and Right. Yeah. No, I hear you. I hear you. Well be careful out there and I sure appreciate you guys coming on the show and and sharing the, the encounters and what's been going on in that property and again please, please, please be careful. Uh, with these things because again you never know how they're going to quite react uh, to you or their behavior uh, if they start coming up you know Jim's a good man I, I always enjoy talking to Jim and I love Mike Woolley to death um, I talk to Mike all the time and, uh, and I know those guys will would help out in two seconds but please be careful but Brandon thank you for uh, coming on and Hazel thank you for coming on yes sir okay, thank you Well, I want to welcome uh, Jim Lansdale to the show. He's a cast member of the series Killing Bigfoot on Destination America, and he's also the founder of the GCBRO. And uh, Jim's a great guy, and people have heard him on the show in the past. I think most of the audience loved hearing his encounter stories and all the stuff he's looked into with Sasquatch. And, you know, I, I know the Killing Bigfoot, um, it, for people, it might be easy for people at first glance to be, be very critical of the show. Uh, but, you know, as long as I've been doing this, Jim, very short amount of time, I, I really respect what you guys do. There's so many people that come to me and just say, hey, we need help. I, I can't get these things to go away. Uh, we need help getting rid of these things. And, you know, it's like, who do you call when something like that happens? You can't call the cops. Uh, and most of these researchers out there, I, I don't know if I'd invite them to my property. I think what you guys do is a good thing. I mean, it it helps people. If nothing else, it helps bring a peace of mind for people out there who are having real problems with these things. Uh, but welcome to the show, Jim. It's good to talk with you again. Well, thanks, Wes. It's good to be here. Uh, 
some of the things that you mentioned, and um, there's a place down there south of me. Uh, a young lady called me, I don't know, several months back, and uh, they had a family down there that was being completely terrorized by Bigfoot. You know, terrorized. And so they invited some researchers in there. They came in there and hung some cameras, so forth, whatever they wanted to do, and uh, had uh, uh, the complete run of the place. They didn't do anything, didn't get any pictures, didn't find any evidence, very little. But uh, the girl called me again and said, this place is crazy with Bigfoot activity down there. And they won't even want anybody in there that's associated with Bigfoot, you know, any type of research, because people went in there and, you know, uh, it's their hobby. They want to get a picture and tell everybody they're a Bigfoot researcher and they do more damage than they do good, especially when you get around these Bigfoot that are real aggressive. And some of them that we have here in the South are aggressive. Well, this one place that I was at today, I, I hung a three-camera video system down there, and uh, this lady walked out, I guess, uh, Sunday a week ago, something like that, and it was right at dark, and she stepped on her first step and just looked up, and she said there was a nine-foot Bigfoot standing there staring at her within 39, 35, 40 foot uh, of her. Of course, it scared the crap out of her. When she called me, she couldn't even talk, Wes. It scared her so bad. And uh, so we went down, we did some investigation. Uh, uh, she showed us where the siding was. On, it was just happened to be on the pasture side of the truck where she got a real good look and a good estimated height. And uh, she and her husband butcher animals. So she's a pretty good guess at, at weight. And she said that she thought it weighed a thousand pounds. So that's a big creature for here. Last night, she and her younger son uh, going to town she gets out on the road, and she said it was a baby Bigfoot. She said estimated weight about 15 pounds, started running down the middle of the road. And she said she followed it for over 200 yards before it finally bailed off the road. She told me she could have run over it at any time that she wanted to. She could even thought she could get out and caught it, but she was afraid to do so. And I guess retribution of what could happen if the female, the mother, was there, which is very possible. But... Uh, when we talk about aggressive Bigfoot, that's exactly what we mean. Some that are just relentless uh, coming around your home. And, and the one when she walked out and saw that nine footer, uh, I found impressions and uh, tracks before. So that's not his first visit. The dog stays out of the house, barks all night, and it's just terrorizing them, you know? Yeah, and it's that's why I respect what you do. You go out and you really do help these people. And uh, not that every researcher is bad, but I even had a lady here in Washington State contact me one time. I think I've told this story on the show and wanted me to come out and check out her property. And she had been noticing these large – she just described them as apes. She goes, I don't know if that's what you guys call Bigfoot, but there's apes out here running around. And she said every once in a while they come up and bang on the house. and But they never really – didn't even really bother her dog. Her dog would bark and you know didn't really have any problems, but she wanted me to come, come and look at the area and – see what I thought mm-hmm. and I couldn't make it out there it was about a two-hour drive I just couldn't make it to the property well she had invited some other researchers here in uh, Washington State and they went out there she called me all upset that these guys came out and I guess they started popping off shots at you know every little noise every little tree break they heard I mean they were just I mean reckless reckless popping off shots right. well these uh, guys get to go home she has to live there that's right but they get to go That's home. Exactly right. And what ended up happening is it killed her dog. She had a German Shepherd, and it broke the dog's neck. She woke up, what well, came right. out one morning, couldn't find her dog, and uh, his neck had been broke, and he'd been just thrown in the yard. And they got really violent with her. I mean, they were banging on the house almost on a nightly basis. They'd come in at one, one, two, three o'clock in the morning. They'd throw rocks at the house. There was a couple of times she got rocks thrown at her when she's going out to her car. Uh, they'd come up and growl at the windows, and she said the behavior changed, and she was so upset with those guys because – and I get it. It kind of frustrated me when I heard it. I was like, well, that's easy to show up on someone else's property and start popping off shots, but you get to get in your car and go home and not worry about it. But the people you leave behind, they have to now deal with right. your actions. And uh, I've seen what you guys do. I've had you on the show many times, and I just I really respect what you guys do. I, I wanted to ask you, I just had Hazel and uh, her son Brandon on the show, and it, she had mentioned several times you had gone out there, and I'm going to write Destination America uh, an email 
uh, demanding when the next episode is going to be on of Killing Bigfoot because right. I know you guys were out there and anything you, you shouldn't say, you know, because the TV show, you, if there's a question to ask, you just say, hey, I, I, I can't go into that. But I wanted to ask you, what, what well, evidence did you find going out there? Well, we found tracks of six or eight different animals, uh, you know, good impressions and um, from small to large. Uh, a lot of whistles and growls and howls and a lot of vocalizations that we were there. Uh, one man had a sighting. Uh, one fellow, I think, had the stench put on him while he was there. Uh, a tremendous area there, but their property adjoins with uh, uh, a WMA. So, you know, they're just miles and miles and miles of uh, what we'd consider wilderness areas, you know, that people are going very seldom, or maybe a hunter goes in on occasion. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, definitely a hot spot. These people are getting tired of, you know, these creatures come around their home. Uh, and you'll see when you see the program, you'll see the uh, one of the owners, the man, the, the dad, told me he just quit hunting. He's afraid to go in the woods. So, uh, I mean, that's a hell of a note when you're 60 years old or 55 or whatever it is and, and hunted all your life on your property, and now you're afraid to go hunt, you know, because of these creatures. And uh, had they not been coming around their home and bothering them, and uh, uh, they'd already got their dog if they could catch him. But he's, he's under the house. He's pretty smart. You know, he'll get up and loaf a little bit during the day, but at nighttime, uh, he's in, he, he's underneath the house. As a matter of fact, Russell told me today, and Brandon told me today, that he was under the house all night last night barking. So, and yeah, I know it could be a deer, an armadillo, or anything like that. Uh, and it very well could have been. But it also could have been some of these Bigfoot coming around their home again, because I found tracks around their home, um, so in close proximity. Same thing that goes on around Goldana, Wes. It's uh, it's just a mess. Uh, it's kind of simmered down at Goldana now, but at one time, my God, if you wanted to see a Bigfoot, that was a place to be, because they were everywhere down there at one time. What's interesting is there. It's Hazel is a cousin to uh, Mike Woolley. And you know Mike right. really well, and you you know his encounter that that happened to him. And I was shocked when Hazel mm-hmm. said his encounter only happened five. I, think, I can't remember if it was Hazel or Brandon, but said it was only five or six miles away. And I was like, what? And because right. when you hear Mike's encounter, I mean, he has one hell of an encounter. And between yeah. you and I, I think Mike was in some real danger that day. Uh, but being yeah. so close to their property is what worries me. Why do you think that they're in that area? Well, it's just a wilderness area. I mean, it's it's rural enough, but yet then again, it's populated enough. Uh, you know, there's <laughs> fishermen all up and down. You've got the uh, Toledo Bend and the river. Uh, there's plenty of food, plenty of cover, plenty of water. Uh, that's why they hang. I mean, that's their habitat right there. And when I tell people to go to Toledo Bend and, and uh, Sabine River, if they want to uh, research Bigfoot or find evidence, that's the place to go. Uh you can't find evidence of a Bigfoot if you don't go where they are, and that's where they are. I know Hazel talked about uh, seeing one one night when she was going out to the truck, and she describes it as being about nine feet tall and about a thousand pounds. Uh, and right. what's interesting is she had mentioned she just bought a bunch of chicks, and she had the heat lamps on mm-hmm. and and everything else. Do you think they're just coming around for curiosity on that property, or do you think that there's some real problems going on there? Well. I- you know, it could be curiosity as well uh, as some type of, you know, food, looking for something to eat. Now, they haven't lost any animals that I'm aware of as of yet. That doesn't mean that they're not. Because when times, you have to understand, that place is hog heaven. Uh, there was just hogs everywhere. A lot of deer, a lot of hogs. Plenty of food, meat for them to eat. Um, but these ones that are aggressive come around, they're curious, and they come around these homes. And they find out it's easier to get a, a, a dog or a chicken out of a pen than it is to run or catch a deer. So that's how it starts, and it progresses. Start in the trash can. Of course, like I said, it's a slaughterhouse down there. They, you know, they skin and clean animals for a living. And, uh, of course, they haul the guts and stuff off, but still the smell is there. Yeah, that makes sense. And she had mentioned that to me. Hazel said she hadn't lost any animals because I asked her that specifically, and she said no, they hadn't lost anything. Uh-huh. But it's uh, yeah. one part that I thought was interesting is when Hazel said, uh, and I think even Brandon said this, when they heard the, heard the whooping, they always assumed it was the cattle ranchers down there roping in their cattle or trying to bring their cattle in. And uh, so they never paid it that much attention. And 
now that uh, you know Brandon's seen one, Hazel's seen one, uh, and they're finding mm-hmm. these footprints. It's interesting because, you know, a lot of people will pass things off like that. They'll hear strange whistles and pass it off as a bird or they'll pass it off as uh, someone just some person out there. Uh, And Brandon, you know, he told me he found those tracks. I wanted to ask you, how many tracks are you finding? Are you finding different sizes of tracks out there? Sure. We find them different sizes, yeah. Uh, Anywhere from six or seven, eight inch impressions up to 14, 15, you know. Uh, which is not uncommon for this part of the country. Um, just, you know, we haven't found any real good tracks because it's a dead gum dry here. Um, need some rain, desperately. But, uh, yeah, they're, they, I'm telling you, Wes, they have them of all sizes there. Uh, they have the female, they have the male. I mean, obviously the female because of the baby last night running down the road and why that baby got away and or spooked or whatever. I mean, I just have no idea. Uh, but where it went in the woods, like I said, she followed it for about 200 yards. And she showed me where it went in the woods. And, of course, it was thick like you would not believe. I mean, without my briar cutters, I wouldn't have attempt to go through there. Why it was there, what it was doing, I have no idea. And when you go out to a property like this, Jim, what, what are you hoping to accomplish? Are you trying to get pictures of them? Are you? How do you deter these things from coming around? Beyond just shooting. Well, there's, yeah, yeah, there's certain things I do, and, and uh, I like to walk the property, and uh, I like to look for their sign. And when I find their sign, then I try to find some type of uh, area that they're traveling back and forth in, and then I set up in those areas. Then I know what I'm, you know, whether to set up cameras to video or whatever. And uh, they know that we hunt. When we go down at night, they know we're there, so we're not fooling anybody. These aggressive ones really don't care at times. They're going to come anyway. We've had that happen several times. Uh, one of the films you'll see in, that we shot in southeast Texas, uh, the security light came on one night, and we had a hunter there. Two other people were there, and they actually thought they saw the animal. Yeah, they're aggressive. They'll come see you. Yeah, no, I tend to agree with you on that. You'll have to keep me up to date and let me know what, what happens out there, Jim. I, I would love to have you back on for an update, have Hazel back on. And I know Brandon, uh, he had, he was a wealth of information when he was just on talking and I really enjoyed talking right. with them. And, you know, I, I love the good folks. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. You know, you, the people from the South, uh, especially the country folk are, are, uh, my, my kind of people, you know, that's uh, yep. very kind, very generous people. And, you know, very straightforward on what they saw. Uh, there's no, right. Nothing else added, nothing else taken away. I just saw this, and here's what it looked like. And uh, But it worries me in that area, especially after hearing Mike's encounter. And I think they've uh, – you know the area better than I do. I think they've probably been in the area for a while. But uh, oh, yeah. the fact that they're coming up to the home worries me a lot. Well, you know, Wes, here's the thing about it is they've been coming around these people's homes forever. They're just now starting to you know, realize that, yeah, there's something around my house because – I mean, surprised that the people that have Bigfoot come around their home, they won't even tell anybody. They won't even mention it because they think they're crazy. Yeah, I'll have to have you uh, back on Jim Lansdale killing Bigfoot on Destination America. You can also find Jim on Facebook, uh, GCBRO, cool group to uh, join. Uh, a lot of information that you guys post on there. Uh, Jim, I'll have to have you back on. Thank you so much for coming on and just giving us your take on what's going on around this property. Okay, Wes. Hey, I enjoyed it. Have a great night, and I'll talk to you later. Thanks, Jim. And I want to welcome uh, Tom Seawood back to the show. If you go to Hamumu Adventures, uh, you can join one of his expeditions. I know he'll take you out. Uh, you know, to look for Sasquatch, talk about some of the uh, First Nation legends. And uh, there's kayaking trips, there's boat trips, take you out and into the woods. It's www.hamumuadventures.com. Tom, thanks for coming on the show again. Yeah, La Costa. Nice to hear from you again, Wes. Thanks for inviting me on again. Yeah, it's good to hear from you. Uh, tell us about an upcoming expedition that you're doing. Well, the magic of your... Sasquatch Chronicles podcast, I was being overwhelmed with emails and private messages, Facebook messages, posts about 
people wanting to, I guess, go out in the bush and experience with me, Sasquatch Bigfoot. So a few years ago, I had a website and a tourism company that was called Aboriginal Adventures Canada. And uh, I advertised the Sasquatch Bigfoot expedition on there and I never got any takers, you know, I, and uh, other than just day trips and, you know, one overnight. But uh, this time with it's just overwhelming all the people. And then, of course, I'm on Facebook nowadays and I'm always talking about Sasquatch Bigfoot. So I just thought, well, Peggy and I were sitting there and she has the Hamumu Adventures, which means butterfly in my native language. And she does glamping, which is high end camping and sea kayaking and walking tours and that. She's just building the website right now. And we, we said, well, why don't we start and do a Seattle Sasquatch Safari where we walk them through and share the First Nations perspective, as I was talking about before on one of the podcasts. So we did that and got some interest. And then there was a lot more interest for multi-day overnights. So I just all last this week, I just sat at the laptop and designed these packages. So if anyone, right now, Peggy's going to try to get two more on the website, humumoadventures.com. But if they're not up there, the yacht tour and the boat tour, one that brings you deep into the coastal British Columbia coast, just email me through the website or my personal email, which is Wes has put up, and I'll send you the PDFs of the packages. It'd be interesting to get out there with, with people. Um, I look at it like, you know, that's my backyard, and you know, when we're out there and everything, clam digging or fishing or living, it's so cool that you can just walk off a beach and go look around. And next thing you know, you're seeing broken cockle shells and heavy accumulation. Tree snap in one area um, or two different areas. I saw tree snaps and uh, pretty high up, too. I guess maybe call it three now with that one we found during with uh, Todd Neese when we did that Operation Sea Monkey. We found some branches broken like. As far as I could reach, and I'm, I guess, 5'10", five, 5'8". Five, so as far as I could reach, there's tree snaps, so branches snapped off. So there's quite a few, quite a bit of activity up in that region. And uh, I actually just got uh, an email from someone this morning. And on Vancouver Island at a place called Beaver Tail Lake, this fall she was trolling and uh, for trout. And they had tree knocks and branches being busted quite a few times and they went back a couple weeks later just late fall here and this time of the year and sure enough they heard something again so when I get back to Vancouver Island next week that's the first place I'm gonna go is straight up there and go look around Beavertail Lake on Vancouver Island. I know you're doing something in January um, is that open to the public or oh yeah Definitely, like um, January eighth, I had we had the first booking of the Moon Adventures for a Sasquatch expedition. It was really neat. A gentleman uh, contacted us and asked for some info, and then confirmed, "Yeah, I'm there. I want four days, four nights, which is five days." So we're going to the camp on Vancouver Island that were have some cabins built that look like cedar miniature native longhouses slash big houses with native designs on the front. They're very rustic. Um, I built them for summer use years ago. And uh, what we do with the five or six cabins is we when it's cold. I've been out there in wintertime when they're out hunting one time. It was probably, I guess, Fahrenheit. Um, it was probably around just above freezing. So I guess it'd be 33, 34 degrees. It was pretty cold with the wind. But you just put candles. You light half a dozen, eight candles and put them on the two by four um, horizontal studding on the walls and on a bench and because it's only 8 foot by 10 foot these cabins, I call them glorified garden sheds, they really heat up and uh, right on the edge of Johnson Straits watch the whales go by It'd be humpback whales this time of year and transient orcas that eat uh, marine mammals and other whales and then of course the ships going by and then that whole area is a lot of activity it's right beneath on the west side of uh, a mountain called Newcastle Ridge. And on the south side of that mountain is the community of Sayward, Kelsey Bay on Vancouver Island East. And man, there's a lot of, I lived there for seven years and everyone's got a story in that region, loggers, truck drivers, you name it, helicopter pilots. And so 
I'm going to spend five days, you know, no, actual fact, what's going to happen is because the way I take bookings for Sasquatch tours, it's not, hey, I have two weeks off in January. I'd like to book. Tide levels are key this time of year on the coast of Pacific Northwest coast. There's low tide, of course, but every day it fluctuates and distant that a distance that it does go low. So the way they have it calibrated is they have what they call a mean high tide, which is the highest of high tides, which happens once every few years. And we just went through some 16, almost 17 foot tides recently. But the low tide mean number is called zero tide. That means the tide goes out and it goes way, way out. So you're looking at a drop of 16, 17 feet to zero. And those are what we call clam tides because you want to get as much beach as exposed in that short period of time. You know, you got six hours between tide changes. So if you have a small tide where it only goes down to, say, maybe six and a half foot low water, the, the, the big cockle beds aren't exposed. They're still underwater. So you need those zero tides and the minus tides, minus one, minus 1.5 feet, so that it exposes the lower parts of that beach. And that's where you're going to find your cockles, your heavy accumulation of butter clams, horse clams on some beaches, which are really big. So when you people call me or email me, they go, oh, when's your next expedition? The way I operate is on Indian time. And I like to say that because, you know, it's <laughs> natives are kind of like the Mexicans with manana. Anna, you know, tomorrow. So Indian time, if and when we show up, you're damn lucky we showed, I like to say. But in all honesty, you can't, Indian time doesn't work in tourism or business or anything like that. So doing these expeditions, Indian time means we're looking at the tides. So when someone calls me, I say, let me look at the tide book. So I go to the tide tables, and that's what's happening on January 8th through the 15th. We have some nice low tides. I think they're getting down to two foot low and not kind of hard because I'm Canadian. I always want to use kilometers. So about a kilometer from the cabins is a nice shellfish beach. So I guess in miles terms, that would be a third of a mile. There's a nice shellfish beach. So we'll be, and a low tide happens at dark, just when it gets dark, which is good because it means we'll get to the beach hour before dark. We'll set up in the bushes, depending on which way the wind's blowing too, mind you, because if it's, a, hopefully it'll be a southeast wind. So we're downwind on the beach. And as darkness comes, that beach is going to get nice and exposed where shellfish are. And we're going to watch with our night vision um, devices. <laughs> Listen, I just, we're going to buy some of these. Me and Peggy were in uh, Bass Pro Shop last weekend and we're pricing out toys that we can use, I call them. And those earmuffs that you're that are sound enhancers man that's magic stuff i tried them out with operation sea monkey i was just amazed at how you can hear such good distance and sound so we'll have those we're going to buy a couple pairs of those and then hopefully those big fellas come out and the way everything's laid out there that we're right at the base of that mountain and that's the only place that there's shellfish and if we look at that trout fishing report i was just telling you about on vancouver island probably 40 maybe 30 miles distance from where the we're going to be doing the expedition late fall and as peggy and i were talking this morning when that report came in i said you know it's really interesting when i get these reports when this time of the year those bigfoot sasquatches should be in salmon streams and i named them right close proximity to campbell river where beavertail lake is you know there's campbell quinsome river systems the uh, Menzies Bay system, Trout Creek, Armo de Cosmo, which is Bear River. So having that sighting take place when the salmon beds were just filled with salmon spawning in, you know, three inches of water in some places, that Sasquatch shouldn't be banging trees up in Beavertail Lake telling trout fishermen that I don't want you around here. So what that does is I look at that and I think it's, like some bears, some black bears won't come off those alpines till the snow comes. They'll stay up on those mountains, eat, feed, feeding on berries and plant life and taking down deer, eating uh, squirrels and things. So I kind of 
through the years looking at all these reports on this time of the year, and it's prime shellfish time as well, and you got Sasquatches being sighted up on lakes where there's no salmon streams and no clam beach in close proximity. You know, there's, I think they have tribal territories, and that's why going to where this cabins are, where I did the sea kayak adventures for years, and um, well, it's what the people stay in, to stay in these native-style longhouses and look out at the orcas going back and forth, and it's away from the major congestion site of Telegraph Cove and Campbell River. It's right in between these two centers of whale watching by tour boats and by kayaks and speedboats. So being at the halfway mark where I, these cabins are, no one's there. So it's a great sea kayak place in the summer, sports fishing for big, huge salmon because there are millions of them are going right by my front doors there. But because of the Sasquatches and it's so, you know, the odd only people that are really out there, the odd elk hunter and deer hunter and, of course, uh, the loggers every now and then. But the way logging is done on Vancouver Island it's very, um, they do cut blocks now instead of these massive clear cuts where they used to be there for years and months at a time. Now they do these cut blocks and it's very uh, mechanized with hoe chuckers, um, backhoes with uh, blades on them and branch strippers and bucking it in the right length. These things go in and a couple guys go into an area, they drive in their pickup truck, jump in their machinery, cut, stack, load logging trucks four o'clock in the afternoon they're done there's no camps out there no more so this is a real wild area january 8th we're going and definitely you know if anyone wants to come just send me an email or a phone call or whatever and come along and we're charging 275 dollars per person per 24 hour period and the reason why i say that is i run on indian time i don't have these we have a structured four-day package, and you will show up at 8 in the morning, and you'll be dropped off at 9.30, four days later. I don't do that. That's for people with other tourism operations. We run on Indian time, and that just means your schedule's our schedule. And, uh, you know, it's about having fun. Schedules are for the concrete world, not for the bush world. And, you know, that way people can say, all I can afford is two days. Well, they fly in or drive into Vancouver, Vancouver Island and, get a vehicle, drive out with us, and then, you know, if they rent a vehicle or bring their own, they can drive out whenever they want. And all-inclusive means we're supplying all the sleeping bags, bedding, foam mattresses, um, candles, food, all your beverages, um, hot and cold, no alcohol. Um, I don't mind if someone brings a six-pack or a bottle of wine, no problem, but uh, this is not uh, sports fishing, smoking cigars and Telling big lies while we're drinking two bottles of scotch at night. That's not going to happen. Not out in bush. It's too dangerous. And besides that, nighttime, we're we're investigating. We're trying to find these things. And there you go. Yeah, and I hopefully I'll make it up there for that January 8th. I'd love to go out with you. I'd love to see it. And I'd love to do a show from there. Um, I know before we wrap it up, uh, well, one thing I want to ask you, Tom, go ahead and give your email address and the phone number out again. It's tom.seawid at gmail.com tango oscar mike dot sierra echo whiskey india delta at gmail.com and uh, the web address is hamumu.com just think of um, laughter cow cow so ha ha mumu m o o m o o adventures.com hamumu.com and uh like I say, that Peggy's should be putting the boat packages up today. We have everything from a, it's a Grizzly Bear Whale Watch high-speed aluminum tour boat covered, heated, inside bathroom, and uh, it takes eight people. When you see the price on that or if you get a hold of me and uh, I can email you the PDFs, that one and the yacht tour, when you see the prices for a 24-hour period, it's going to make your eyeballs go wide. Remember, these are all-inclusive both boats can take up to eight people. So if you look at those day rates and you divide it by eight and then you factor in what it would cost to feed yourself up in Canada for three meals and restaurants, plus your hotel room accommodation, plus your $1,600 a day rental of a 18 to 25 foot fiberglass or aluminum sports fishing boat for salmon, it's a pretty good price. So, and that's only eight hours what they give you for 1600 and we're giving you for the boat, one package we have there, we're giving you that boat 24 hours a day while you book it. And that's aluminum one is great. Eight people on board, 
we can actually shove that thing right up the beaches. So if we see something on the beach and we got to get on there ASAP, quick, try to get a picture, film or something, that boat's perfect. So hopefully some of you guys will come out with me and learn the native perspective. It's going to be fun. Get to hear about Chonakwa, Bakwas, and how other native people call the small one Steamtum and the big one Hawakwas and how the Haidas, they have stories about a creature they call Gogeet. And all through British Columbia's coast, as a commercial fisherman, I heard stories about books and book books and the big fellas and the mountain apes. So when you guys come out, we'll scare the hell out of you around the campfire at night after investigating with all the stories. And there you go. Yeah, it sounds like a blast. Again, it's HamumuAdventures.com. Uh, Tom, thanks so much for uh, coming back on the air. I know you wanted to share the Booger Boy story with the audience. Oh, yeah. Would you mind going into that before we wrap it up? It's about 10 minutes, or about 8 minutes. Is that all right? Oh, you got plenty. You got all the time you want. Okay, so this one's just because of the way the world is right now. You know, everyone's doing things that aren't really that good and judging, being very judgmental. So this story comes from my people, the Mamliaka tribe of the Kwakwakiwak Nation from a village known as Mimkwamlis. Otherwise known on the internet as Mamalalakula, village of a last potlatch my ancestral village. Well, many, many years ago, there was a young husband and wife, newly married, living in this village. And they were trying to have children, of course. Ginganadam, we call them, children. And they couldn't try as they might. They weren't blessed with a baby. And uh, one day, the men, they were going to go out in the bush to look for you which is a hardwood that grows here on the coast of BC to make arrow shafts. So the old man rounded up all the men. Come on, you guys, let's go up to the mountain behind the village and harvest yew wood and make arrow shafts. So they get up there and they're cutting down these yew trees and they're splitting it with their axes, making these rough shafts that they're going to bring home. And the older man says, make a lot of shafts, make your bundle big so you can barely carry it. When we get home, we're going to take the knives and we're going to, shape them nice and round like and then we're going to take the skin of the dogfish like sandpaper it's a shark and we're going to sand them so they're smooth and straight then we're going to put our arrowheads and our feathers on them and our notch and we're going to teach our we our young boys how to shoot the bow and arrow and of course they're going to lose and break many so make your bundles big and then that man looked at the young husband who couldn't have children oh you got to a small bundle, you might as well go home right now and go work with the woman, seeing as you're so weak and you don't have children. And a young boy, and all the men started laughing. That's how you say with us native people on the coast, you got big bellies and big cheeks. And when we see a weakness, a chink in your armor, we capitalize that at machine gun you with teasing and jest. That's just our nature, and that's what was happening. And oh, this man, he, he was upset being teased because he couldn't have a child with his wife, so he grabbed his bundles and took off, stormed off mad and upset, humiliated. Well, that same day, the woman, old lady, called all the mothers together. You ladies, come here, young and old. We're going up the hill. We're going to pick quatum, salmon berries. So they went up with their harvest baskets and they were picking away. And they're filling their baskets up. And the old lady said, all you women, fill your basket overflowing because when we get home, we're going to mash it up like a jam and put it on the fronds of the bull kelp and lay it on the hot rocks on the beach. And the sun's going to dry out that jam and that frond, which is long like a streamer and feels like plastic. We're going to peel that berry strip off and dry it even further. And then we're going to roll it up and we're going to put it into boxes, gildas, cedar, bentwood cedar boxes and we're going to feed it to ourselves and to our ginganon and our children in the winter so we don't get sick. Well, we all know vitamin C keeps you from getting scurvy. You didn't know the clockwalk you want invented the fruit roll-up either, but there's some history for you. But anyway, they were picking their berries, and uh, the old lady looked over at that young woman who didn't have kids. Oh, your basket's half full. You might as well go home now. You don't have any children anyway you and your husband are too darn weak and they started she started laughing this old chubby indian woman no teeth cackling and laughing and all the other women jumped in there laughing and they're throwing their salmon berries at this poor young lady who couldn't have children and she just got up with her basket and ran back to the village and when she got down to the village in village island there's a small stream on the west side of our village and there's a big rock 
known as Clay Slagula's Rock. Different legends some other time. But anyway, she was sitting on there crying because she was so upset. And as she was crying and crying and crying, she saw her husband enter the village walking through the front of the big houses. Now, you got to remember our villages, they used to have these big houses called Jokesy, made of red cedar. And you'd have anywhere from 30 to 60 family members living in one of these big houses made of red cedar planks. And on the front of the house is called the Awakwas. It's dirt and it's patio. And that's where they would have their different poles, like their dowry totem pole, their memorial totem pole, their um, welcoming totem pole. And some of you Sasquatch, Bigfoot enthusiasts and researchers, you might have seen a picture, a painting from the 1920s by Emily Carr. And it's a beautiful one of this. Looks like a Jonahua leaning over on the beach, post standing up. Well, that was done in Mimkwamlis, my village. So it shows you what the village looked like with these poles standing up. And one of them used to be the Jonahua, wild woman of the woods. But the woman saw her husband running through the village through all the poles and slammed the door of their big house. She could see he was upset. He, she knew that he too was being teased because he didn't have children. So she's looking up at the sky and she's, ek, 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 I'm a, the creator, why won't you bless me with a child? My husband gets teased. I get teased. Everyone ridicules and laughs at us. It's just terrible living in this village, not having a child. And she's raging and shaking her fist like people do when they get upset normal. It's like a Sasquatch when he shakes a tree. He's getting all upset, raging. So anyway, he she finished crying and what do you do when you finish crying? You got to blow your nose. You got a bunny, the stuff in your nose. So she took out her doe skin. A woman have in the old times, they say, like a handkerchief. And she blew her nose into her hands and wiped her tears from her eyes. And she could hear baby crying away. Wow! Ah, newborn squeal. She looked around the beach. She looked up the beach. She looked behind her. She could hear this baby crying. She's looking all over. There was no baby. And all the women were up the hill picking berries with their babies in their back bundles. And she was thinking, this is very odd. And then she heard it. And she looked down. And she realized the baby's crying was coming from her doe skin. So she opened up the doe skin carefully. There was a little baby beautiful little round-eyed baby boy with two arms and two legs but he had a color to him like the color of what comes from your nose but she looked at him and said i got a we to do a baby boy and she felt her little baby boy with her fingers for the first time smiling and tears of happiness and joy and he felt kind of slippery like the stuff that comes from your nose so she said my young little boy your baby's name will be klindach the same stuff that comes from your nose. And she quickly ran to her house. And when she ran up the beach and through all the totem poles in front of the houses, down the many houses that were in the village of Village Island, Mimkwamlis, she opened the doors of her gukesy, her big house, and she ran in and she's, husband, 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 look, the creators blessed us with a child. And she opened her doe skin and the husband sort of had a start. There was a little round-eyed little baby boy, all right, with two arms, fingers, toes on its two feet and legs, crying away with black hair and kind of a funny color, he said. Well, yes, he's, he was born from my nose. That's why he's that color. And he felt his son for the first time in his hands. And she, he looked at his wife and goes, he's kind of slippery, isn't he? And she goes, well, of course, he was born from my nose. He's like what's in your nose. That's why I call him Klindach, the same color and the same slippery feeling as what comes from your nose. That's where he was born. And the husband smiled and said, I love our new son. I'm going to teach him everything I know. He will be a great hunter and he will have great parents. We will love him because that's what we have to do as parents. And that's what they did. Who, what parent doesn't love their children? So they loved their child and he grew up and he got older and older and he began to learn to walk. And all of a sudden the other native kids in the big house began to pick on him when he was trying to toddle around because he looked funny, he felt funny. He came, was born from a different place than them, came from a different place, so they picked on him. And as he got a little older, when he went outside of the big house to try to play with all the other kingan on him in the village, the children, 
they would really pick on him and because the parents weren't looking, the older girls and boys would bully him. And Klinduch started realizing that this was not very nice things happening to him from these children because he looked funny. He came from a different place than them. So each day, though, when he got out of his big house in the morning, next door he'd run into that big house and he'd go up to Numas, the old man who lived there. Numas, give me a hand. Come on, I'll bring you down to the creek. Grab your bucket and we'll fill it with water. And he'd off him and Numas would go weaving through all the poles and get to the creek at the far end. And Numas would wash and do his teeth, take a drink of water, and then he'd fill his bentwood box with a handle on it. And Klinduch and Numas would walk back into the village, weaving in between all the poles and holding hands until he got to a certain spot. He would say, here you go, Numas, here's your spot. And Numas would sit down and open up his um, leather. And inside were hammer stones, antlers, bone. And he would take nodules of obsidian and flint, shirt, jade. And he would nap and nap and nap. And he'd make beautiful arrowheads, spearheads, knives, harpoon heads for the people in the village. That was his job. And at the end of the day, well, Klinduch, he'd be playing all through the bushes in the village, behind the village, and up the mountain. But when the sun started going down, he'd run home because it was getting the end of the day. And he would grab Numas and say, come on, Numas, I'll bring you home. He'd bring the old man home and the old man would sit down by his fire and he goes, Klinduch, you're such a nice, caring boy. You're always bringing me for my water and my bath in the morning. You're always bringing me home at the end of the work day when you come out of the forest or you're playing with your new friends, the animals. He goes, I'm worried about you, though, in the forest. Junach uh, was out there, the wild woman of the woods. Oh, don't you worry about that, Numas, as long as I stick to what we're told. As long as you listen to your elders, your parents, show them respect. Don't be a whiner. Don't be lazy. Don't be a thief. And when you're told to do something, just do it. Don't pull a temper tantrum. As long as I do that, and when the sun starts to go low and I make sure I leave the forest to come get you, Junach was watching me. I know that. But she knows you can't touch me so long as I listen to the orders of the elders and my parents. So by coming home before the sun goes down, I'm not breaking any rules. So that's all right. I'm not worried about Junachwa. They say she's out there. She's not going to harm you unless you disrespect her anyway. He goes, but all the same, Klinduch, you should have a knife. So here you go. And the old man opened up his leather tools kit and he brought out this beautiful obsidian knife with a nice hardwood you would handle all wrapped. He said, and I can built you a leather sheath as well. So you put this on your belt and away you go with your new knife. And Klinduch was so happy. He ran outside, showed his mom and dad, had his dinner and went to bed. And then the next day he went out into the forest with his new knife. And oh, he was having fun with it after he dropped Numas off to do his job with his flint nap. And after he got his water and everything, of course. And as he was playing, he got pretty late. He was watching the sun come down. He goes, oh, I better go home. And when he got to the edge of the village where that stream is, there was a big grassy field. And there were all the kids from the village playing Indian baseball. You have one person up to bat. What they do is they grab the ball in their left hand usually and they throw it in the air and they hit the ball as hard as they can. And everyone's in the outfield. You catch a pop fly, it's 100 points, you're automatically up to bat. Catch a one bouncer, 50 points. Uh, roller, 10 points, a dead ball, five points. As soon as you get 100 points, you're up to bat. You keep track of your own scores. But every time someone gets 100 points or catches a pop fly, they're automatically up to bat, and you start from zero again. It sounds like a very boring game, but you got to remember, Indian baseball, full contact. So when you got your mouth wide open, you're running backwards with your hands up, ready to catch that pop fly, and all you're concentrating on is that ball and its trajectory coming at you, well, those girls, you got to watch out. They used to grab you by your hair and just power slam you right down. Then you grab the ball. So Indian baseball is full contact, like murder ball with a stick. Lots of fun. <laughs> well, as they're playing this, the older boys and girls would hit the ball so far, it'd go right to the tree line. But it'd land where it's shady. And what grows in the shade in the coastal rainforest? Chum chum clum. Stinging nettles. When you touch it, it's like that. what I hear about that stuff called poison ivy, but you don't 
get those bad, bad blisters. You get blisters and itch, like jellyfish thing. So anyway, the ball would go there, and no one wants to go in there tiptoeing around trying to get the ball from the stinging nettles. But when Klindach walked out, the older boy at the bats said, Hey, Klindach, my friend. Klindach couldn't believe his young years. First time he was being called a friend. Klindach, my friend, come here. You go over there by the trees, and you play Indian baseball with us. Klindach couldn't believe his young years. First time in his life he was being included in the kids games. So of course he ran. Little did he know that he was being teased and ridiculed once again because he was a different color. He felt different. He came from a different place than the children had come. He was standing up to his neck in Jum Jum Club, but he was so excited that he was allowed to play. He didn't feel a stinging and the blisters starting to come up, but they started playing. And of course, Klinduck ain't going to get anything but, um, dead balls in there and he's never going to get up to bat they're just using them like a retriever dog so he's in there anyway and he's playing with everyone and all the villages kids are having fun and they're having so much fun they're making so much noise that they don't realize that the sun is disappearing over what we call vancouver island but Junakwa does because she's watching from the forest always watching the kinganon and the children because when they misbehave it's open season for them for her well, sure enough, the mothers came out of the big houses and called across the Alakwas in the village for their children to come home. It was dinner time. It was getting dark, but they never heard. They're too far away. As soon as that sun disappeared behind the western island, Jonah come running out of that bush, and all the kids started screaming and running around, banging into each other, trying to hide behind trees, trying to climb trees. But Jonah with her big hairy arm, just kept grabbing kids, screaming, shoving them into her big spruce root sack which is like a potato sack. Spruce root produces a fiber. So she's throwing these screaming kids into the sack, knowing that, wow, I'm going to... And she's licking her lips, and she's grabbing kids. And she looks all around, and she's got every kid. And then she looks over to the tree line, and there's this funny colored boy, almost the same color greenish as what the Jum Jum Clubs are. So she missed him. But now she sees him, and his eyes blinking, and he's terrified. He's frozen. Well... Jonah grabs her sack full of children. And she starts running after Klinduk and she goes into the reach to grab him. But when she grabbed him, he squirted away because he was so slippery. And he started running. And as he's running around the field, Jonah with her big long legs and she's running fast and she'd grab Klinduk again with her hands and he'd slip and pop out again because he's so slippery. Finally, she gets that big right arm around Klinduk screaming and wiggling. She stuffs him on top of the sack and ties it throws that sack of screaming, crying children over her shoulder, and she starts running into the forest up the mountain. And she's going to her invisible home. That's why we never find the Sasquatch Bigfoot, because they live in an invisible home up high in the mountains, they say. But as she's running, she's licking her lips, thinking, when I get to my invisible home, I'm going to boil these kids up and eat them. I got lots of food. That's what Junichas do with the misbehaving children. So anyway, they're... She's running away and the kids are screaming. It's getting dark now. All of a sudden, Klinduk on top of the sack goes, shh, you can get on him. Listen to me and quit crying. Because I'm slippery, I'm going to wiggle and squirm and I'm going to slip slide my way to the bottom of the sack. And I'm going to cut it with the knife that the flint knapper made and gave me. And we're going to spill out onto the forest floor. And they say, Tonach is not too smart. She has no frontal lobe. And when we hit that forest floor, we're all going to grab each other's hands and I'm going to lead us back to the village of Mimkonlis. So this older boy who's all elbow to elbow with him goes, shut up, Klinduk. What do you know? We're going to go die. We're going to get eaten by Tunuk. And Klinduk goes, you listen here, ringleader, because you instigated all the other kids and bullied them to bully me and pick on me. You're now in my playground because you guys wouldn't let me play in the village without teasing me and beating me up, throwing things at me. While we're in the forest, and this is my playground, I know it like the back of my hand almost. But also, my friends, the animals, are going to help us. You just watch. So he wiggled and squirmed, and sure enough, he slid right to the bottom of that sack, and he cut it, and all the kids spilled out. And Junichua, with no frontal lobe, she didn't realize because she's kind of dumb. That her bag was empty, her sack. She just kept plodding along into the forest. And they all grabbed hands and they ran down the trail. And they're running down the forest trail. And all of a sudden they come to a junction. And Klinduk leading the bunch 
everyone holding the, each other's hands. The older boy behind him goes, see, you're lost, Klindach. You don't know where we are. Junoch is going to get us. He goes, you be quiet. And Klindach began to whistle. And all of a sudden, the chaos, the deer, stuck its head out of the bushes and said, Klindach said, you're the out in the forest, deer, tonight eating your foods with your bright, powerful nose your, and your keen ear, hearing with your big ears. Please tell me, where's the Junoch? The deer looks up into the night sky and smells. Oh, her scent's getting weaker. She's getting further away. My ears tell me she's crashing through the forest, getting close to the top of the mountain on this island. But Klindach looked and said, hey, I noticed when you stuck your nose up and smelled in the moonlight, I could see your muzzle was wet. You've taken a drink of water. Where is this creek? And Gawas, the deer, says, oh, just keep going down this trail. you come to a creek. It's quite a ways, but there you go. And he goes, good. I need to find a creek that will lead us back to the village. So they run down this trail, and they're going quite a ways. And all of a sudden, the little Ganabi do that. Klindach is hanging on to a little girl. She begins crying, so he stops to lie in the game. Ganabi do, why do you cry? I'm afraid that we're lost. This might not, not be the right trail. And Klindach goes, well, here, let's just see if my other friends are out. And he whistled again, and the big, huge black bear, Clay, stuck his nose out of the forest. Klindach, my friend, what are you doing? Junoch lurks. What are you doing in the forest with these kids at night? I know, black bear. That's why we're trying to get down to the creek somewhere down this hill. But you, the black bear, are the maker of the trails, bear trails in the forest that all the animals and the humans use. So this trail that you've built and use, where does it lead? Does it lead to a creek? Oh, yeah, just keep going. You're almost there. Now be gone with you. You get down that creek and get back to the village. So off they ran, and sure enough, there was a creek, and they followed the trail alongside the creek, and they went downhill and straight down to what they thought was going to be the village. But Klindach had to be sure. So when they got close to where they could smell salt water and hear waves, he stopped, and he whistled again. And that's when the little mink, Klesla, He's stuck his head out, and he's crabby, the mink. He's like, Klindok, what are you doing in the forest? Stinking you and the humans you lead. You're stinking up this forest. This is, I'm hunting, you know. What are you doing here? And Klindok goes, mink, my friend, you make your home in the forest, in the den, and you also make your home close to a freshwater creek, which is close to a beach where you harvest a lot of your foods as well. So, mink, is this creek going to lead me to the village? Yes, it is. Now be gone with you and let me hunt. And off Klindok ran down the creek. And sure enough, they came out at the beach. Where the, and on the edge of the beach was at the top of it was the grass field where Junoch had caught, caught them earlier. And Klindok ran down into the village with all these children, dropping them off at their rightful home. And when he got to his house... His mom and father, like everyone else's mother and father, hugged the kids crying in joy that their children had survived being taken by Junoch. They weren't boiled up and eaten. And Klindoch looked at his mother and father and said, I'm tired. I need to go to sleep. So he went to bed. The next morning he woke up and his eyes went really big real fast And because all these men were standing around him. And one of the men standing around him was the Gekame, the chief of the village. And he looked down and he said, men, grab Klindok and bring him outside. Oh, he was so scared. He thought he'd done something really, really terrible. And they're really going to tease and ridicule, pick on him now. And when they carried him out into the sunlight, he's blinking his eyes because it's so bright. And he, when he could see good, he noticed that every one of the villagers, young and old, were standing on the Awakwas area of the front of the big houses, the patio. And the chief said with his big booming voice, this young boy is Klindok. He was born from the nose. He comes from a different place than all of us. He feels like what's in your nose, and he's the color of what's in your nose. But we have to honor him and respect him always as just another one of us. I know the teasing he's been putting up with, and even I have been a part of that, judging him and judging him wrongly. From this day forward, as the chief, I give order that he's another tribe member, and that's it. No better, no less than us. He's one of our own, and we'll respect him as such. And he says, but because I'm a chief, I'm going to give him another name because for 
God's sakes, you can't be called Booger Boy Klinduch forever. And the chief gave him another name. I can't remember what it was, but he was no longer called Booger Boy Klinduch. That's the end of the legend. But the meaning of the legend, aside from the Sasquatch, Bigfoot stuff I shared with you, is we have to be like the flint napper. He loved Klinduch because he was a human being. He loved Klinduch because he was respectful and caring, looked after the old man. You see, when Klinduch was leading him through the village to get his water and wash up and do his teeth and then to bring him home at the end of the day, the old man was blind. That's why he was such a good flint napper because he was just using his feelings. But he judged Klinduch as we as humans are supposed to judge every other human around us. It doesn't matter what color their hair is. It doesn't matter what color their skin is. It doesn't matter if they even feel different than us. We have to be like the flint napter. We only judge people by what's inside them, a caring heart. And that's it. That's the end of the legend. That's a great story, actually. Had a lot of meaning to it, you know, how we treat each other nowadays. And I enjoyed hearing it, Tom. I really did. And I can't wait to uh, till January. Hopefully I can make it down there. Uh, for the audience listening, again, it's HamumuAdventures.com. Uh, HamumuAdventures.com. Tom Seawood. Tom, thanks so much for uh, coming on the show. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Having fun with this. And like I say, it's the magic of the internet and everything. If anyone wants to get a hold of me, just go right ahead. I thank you all in our language. Go in peace. Thanks again, Tom. And that's it for tonight, everyone. If you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. Wes at SasquatchChronicles.com. Until next time, everyone, have a great night. Something that quite